Hey Alchemists, and welcome to part three of our rainbow series, Defy Gravity. Now when I talk about defying gravity, what I'm talking about really is transmuting the metaphorical lead, right, of our in our soul, right? We defy gravity by excavating our inner landscape or our energetic system, and we discover where our suffering is. Now believe it or not, we don't always see where our suffering is. In fact, we might just, we can become so conditioned that instead of realizing we're suffering, we will think, well, this is just life, right? We just have to deal with it. There's nothing I can do about it. I just have a hard life. I was just dealt a, a crappy hand, right? I don't have luck on my side. But see, if we see our life this way from a disempowered perspective, it may be that there is something in our shadow and we heal the pain in our shadow by calling forth grace. Now, when we're in our shadow, we let the most fearful limited version of ourselves drive our bus. See, the shadow is where we felt the pain of life and we didn't know how to cope with it. So that wound has never been healed. We don't know when we're in our shadow, we don't know that we actually have access to grace and it's grace that heals the wound of the shadow. So when we're in our shadow, the biggest thing that drives our choices is the fear of being humiliated. And so when we are developing the awareness of where we are suffering, we learn to take responsibility for where we are right now and how to start from where we are. We don't take responsibility for everything that's happened to us if, if, it, if it's not our fault, okay? If somebody else did it, you know, they did it. But what we're doing is we're taking responsibility for how we show up starting right now. And this is how we become empowered. And we can start calling forth the light, the grace, the quality of spirit that we need in that moment. So we start the process of healing. So we defy gravity and we live as a, a practical mystic and meaning we see the world as a mystic, right? We see God in all things, right? God is the everywhere present force that it is, but we act in the world as an alchemist. We take a stand in the here and now. We decide how we're going to show up. We decide that like starting now, we can listen and act in faith. And this is how we start transmuting the weight of our suffering, okay? That metaphorical lead into gold. So today I'm going to talk about the shadow and the grace of the solar plexus, which is represented by the color of yellow. Now in our solar plexus, this is our personal identity, okay? Our sense of self, self-esteem, self-respect, and personal accountability. Now, when we have healthy self-esteem, this changes how we show up in our life. We honor the divine in ourself and in others. Carolyn Mace says this, the ingredients that make up self-esteem are essentially the same ingredients that energetically contribute the most to your health. So when she's saying ingredients, She's talking about the qualities that we embody with healthy self-esteem, right? That serve as a positive energy supply to our physical body. And those positive qualities would be that we trust ourselves, we set healthy boundaries. We're not afraid to say no when we mean, mean no, right? We don't need to people please because we're willing to be uncomfortable in telling somebody no, right? They're, they're not gonna like it and they may be negative about that. But you know what? That's on them, right? We're setting healthy boundaries. So we say yes when we mean yes, no when we mean no. Now, if we are in our shadow, those qualities will look different. We won't trust ourselves or what it is that works through us. And we might end up showing up in our life as a doormat because we want to make sure everybody's happy because we just can't deal with it. Somebody doesn't like that we didn't show up for them, right? Now, all of this, all of, you know, the shadow, our shadow wounds, they do seem to originate in our first chakra, okay, our root chakra. 
And within that shadow is the feeling of not being enough. And when we don't feel like we are enough, that kind of triggers the way to get wounded through all the chakras. Okay. Now the shadow of the solar plexus is spiritual entitlement, right? It's all about me. I'm special. Things should be easy, right? I shouldn't have to work too hard for anything, right? God should do all the work. The universe should do all this work. Um, and that might look like in our life. Well, I want good health, but I don't want to have to eat right or exercise or take healthy supplements or, or get a good night's sleep. Just give me a pill. Okay. If we, if we want to start a business, it, we might say something like, well, you know, if the universe wants me to do this, it'll just happen, right? We want the easy alternative when we are in the shadow, right? We want things to just fall into place. And then if it doesn't work out, we just blame somebody, right? It's my family was never very supportive or, well, I guess God didn't want this to happen for me. Right. Or, you know, my ex made my life miserable and now I can't think straight. Okay. So that's one aspect of the shadow of entitlement. Another aspect is bad things only happen to other people, right? Bad things only happen to other people, not me, not my family. All right. So, well, why am I sick? Why do I keep getting sick all the time? That's so unfair. Why did this happen? Why did my business fail? Why did I lose a loved one? Why did I lose my friends, right? These things shouldn't be happening to me. How could this happen to me? It's so unfair, okay? So when we're saying that, it's so unfair, all right? Now, I have a, a quick story about my own recent entitlement in that I got a, I got a remote here for this, this program that I'm recording this on and the remote wasn't working, right? And I mean, God forbid I read the instructions for it, right? Instead, I just start playing with it. I'm like, you know, I have so much to do. This really just needs to work right for me right away. Right? I shouldn't have to work so hard. It should just be easy for me, right? Because I'm special because I'm busy, okay? So our weird little entitlement issues can come up in, in a lot of different ways, right? Why did I get stuck behind the slow car in traffic? Don't they, don't they know I have somewhere I have to be? This just isn't fair. Okay, so entitlement shows up in weird little ways. But one of my favorite biblical stories of entitlement, I, I always get real excited when I get to share, when, when I talk about this shadow. And it is the story of Job, right? Job. The story has a lot of moving parts. Well, it's about how there are a lot of moving parts in our life and that when things happen, it's not necessarily personal. Okay. And we're going to see how this wasn't actually personal to Job. Okay. So what happened was initially it starts with a conversation between Yahweh and Satan and Satan being the adversary, the contradictor. Satan's having a conversation with Yahweh and Yahweh's bragging about Job how righteous he is, how he's constantly praising the Lord. Satan says, well, of course he is. You've given him everything. He has a great life. Well, Yahweh says, well, no, he'd still praise me even if he lost everything. Let's prove it, right? Satan wants to prove it. And so Yahweh gives Satan permission to just wreck Job's life, everything but he can't kill Job, but he can wreck everything else. Okay, so here it goes. Job now loses everything and he is suffering deeply. Okay, he questions the Lord, right? Why is this happening? I'm a good person. Okay, and, and, and this is how he's feeling, right? What did he do to deserve this? Well, three of his good friends come over but they initially start blaming the victim, okay? One of his friends said, well, you must have sinned and now you're being punished. It must have been pretty bad. His other friend says, uh, no, you just need to be more good and more upright and more righteous. Well, his third friend says, nah, you're self-righteous and fearful and you brought this on yourself. So now Job feels betrayed by not just God, but also his friends, okay? 
So now a fourth person shows up here. And this, this gentleman, Elihu, he rebukes Job's three friends. He tells them that they do not understand the wonder that is God. Right, he's talking about how you don't get obsessed with the bad things and with the blaming. You don't get stuck in the problem, right? And you don't give up because life is hard. Then he goes on to talk about the bigness that is God, right? How God is beyond understanding. And he tells Job to consider the wonders of God. But see, now the Lord decides to answer Job and, and comes out of a whirlwind, right? Out of a whirlwind, he says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Stand up like a man, I shall question you. And you declare to me, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. And when did I create the morning stars and all the angels shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with gates when it broke forth as if it had issued from the womb? Have you commanded the dawn since your days began? Or do you know the place of the morning? Where is the dwelling place of light? And, and where is the place of darkness? Do you know its borders and the path to its house? Or in what manner light is distributed? And from where does the wind come from to go forth across the earth? Can you stop the movement of the Pleiades? Or have you seen the path of Orion? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Job was humbled. And it was through the grace of understanding that now Job could actually consider all the moving parts happening in his life, on the planet, in the universe, right? And that we cannot always know why things happen. So through this grace, he was able to instead consider the wonder that is God, to seek the divine. And this is how we accept grace. And, and his life from this moment forward was filled with good things. But see, Job believed the package of his life should be a certain way, right? That he was entitled to a good life because he did good works. Now, when we believe that, right, that life has to be a certain way and it has to show up just how we want it to, or we're not going to be happy. Well, that means that we're not appreciating our life right now, that we're seeing our life right now is not good enough. And that diminishes the goodness and the sanctity of our own life. And we will then be at conflict with the package of our life. And this is where we start to experience suffering, right? This is when we start to ask, why is my life like this? Why can't I get the job I want? Why can't I get the house I want, right? Why is this happening to me? This is not fair. It's just not fair. I see in the shadow, we believe our life revolves around us and we get focused on the conditions. And when the conditions don't go our way, we want the reasons why, right? But see, with the grace of understanding, we are granted the capacity to transcend matters, transpiring at the personal level. This is from Carolyn Mace, right? Now here, most of what happens is actually not personal. Okay, the grace of understanding helps us to see deeper into this. Okay, now when I say not personal, okay, we can, you can probably think of a million things that felt very personal to you. Okay, but as an example, think about this first. Say that you want a parking spot and um, you're waiting. Maybe it's a really crowded parking lot and you're waiting and there's a car signaling that they're gonna back out. So you put on your blinker and you're gonna pull into that parking place. But then another car coming the other direction just zooms right in there before you can, you can do it, right? Now that may feel very personal, right? Because there's, there, there's like a, an implied rule of, of gratitude or thoughtfulness where if somebody was waiting for a parking place, they get the parking place, right? But not everybody will abide by that implied law of thoughtfulness okay and it, so 
they would have done that to whoever was waiting for the parking place, okay? Now let's take it even deeper. Perhaps there was a family member or a good friend, okay? And maybe they envy you. And so maybe they purposefully set out to sabotage something that you're doing. Maybe they talk bad about you behind their back. That's very personal, right? That can feel very personal. But guess what? If they're actually doing that, they're in their shadow. The, the, the worst version of themselves, not the divine self, the worst version of themselves is driving their bus. So again, it's actually not personal. And this is where the, great, the grace of understanding helps us to be able to go deeper. The grace of understanding is about transformation, right? We're never going to probably understand why somebody we care about would stab us in the back. Okay, we're never going to really understand that. Okay, and you know what? Job never knew why anything happened. Not one of his questions were answered. Okay, he never got any clarity. He had no idea that it all comes, came down to a bet between Satan and Yahweh. Okay, so he got no clarity. Instead, the Lord shows up and says, do you have any idea how big I am and how the universe is full of all these moving parts and everything is affecting each other and you just can never know everything, right? That's what Job got, <laughs> okay? But he still experienced transformation through surrender, right? So the grace of understanding helps us to understand that there are so many moving parts in this life and we will never know most everything. The best that we can do is to focus on the wonders that are God, on the bigness that is God, and that how our lives, right, this world is filled with infinite moving parts. You know, every, every day there's probably something is going to come up, especially if you go on social media, where you might say, man, that is just not fair. Man, is there just no, is there just no justice in this world? Right? Man, this isn't how I want my life to be. Things shouldn't be like this. But remember, while Job was dwelling, he stayed in suffering. So when we stay focused on what didn't go our way, we stay in suffering. We create more of that metaphorical lead that we are carrying around, it's weighing us down and we cannot step into the fullness of our divine potential. Now the grace of understanding helps us to stop needing to know everything and instead focus on the wonder that is God, right? So we just go right here, go to our heart and we can ask. Instead of why me, we can ask, all right, what am I gonna do about it? How do I want to show up, right? And we start with grace. We start with grace, right? The grace of reverence, seeing the sacredness in all of life, that all of life is an interconnected field of cosmic activity, right? So we can experience the awe, right? Through, through calling forth the grace of reverence, right? And then the grace of piety, which is seeking out the reverence, concentrating on seeing the divine in all things, right? Even in those people who have done us harm, right? We don't, we don't have to invite them over for dinner, okay? We can set a boundary, we can put up a fence, but we can seek the divine in them, right? We seek the divine in the people around us who eat, vote, pray, parent differently than us. We remember that God is the everywhere present force that it is. And we commit to seeking that, right? To seek the wonders that are God. And then we ask for the grace of understanding so that we can see beyond the obvious and the things that we are taking personal. So that instead, we're learning to understand our part in this sacred partnership. And and how we can serve in this sacred partnership. Like, what's my part? How can I bring more light into this world? And from here, we learn to see our woundedness, right? Whatever's in the shadow. 
as a divine directive, right? So we call forth the grace. We look for the wonder that is God. We look for that bigness. So here is our call to action for this week. I'll start with our affirmation. I seek only the wonder that is God, right? Say that with me. I seek only the wonder that is God. Now, when we see all of life as an interconnected field of cosmic activity, we see that God is at work in all things and all of life becomes available to support you, okay? But if we are blaming and complaining, life cannot show up for us, right? One of my favorite quotes is from Henry David Thoreau, and he says, great hearts steadily send forth the secret forces that incessantly draw great events, right? Great hearts, that's when we're in our Christ consciousness, our I am consciousness, okay, where we are seeking only divine, the divine in all things. We are looking for the wonder that is God steadily, right? We do this steadily with commitment and devotion. And then our great hearts steadily, they send forth secret forces. Those forces are the activity of God in this world, the givingness of spirit to its creations, which it's always doing, right? It's always doing, but we call it forth in greater quantity and in greater power when we are aligned with the divine within and in our I am consciousness, right? And then that incessantly draws out the great events, meaning without interruption, we call forth greater and greater good. There are just so many moving parts in this universe right? So many moving parts just in our life, just in a morning, right? And so many things happen that we can't explain, but we can't see the big picture and we can't know all of the forces that are at play in our lives, but we can choose how we want to show up. We can choose that any day, any way we get to choose how we're showing up. So my invitation for this week is at some point when you are faced with one of those why questions, ask yourself, first of all, all right, am I taking this personally? Do I need it to be a certain way so I can be happy? Okay, maybe I am. So I asked why me? Well, how about this? I'll ask, why not me? Why not me? And claim it as a divine directive, because now you get to choose how to show up, right? Ask yourself that. Well, how do I want to show up in all this? This is going on and maybe I don't like it. How do I want to show up? How do I want to bring the big light to the game? How do you want to bring the big light to the game? And this is a game. It is a game of discovering what it is that works through us, for us, as us. It's a game of discovering what we're capable of when we can finally get out of our own way, right? It is a game where we discover our wounds and we call forth grace to heal those wounds, right? We call forth greater love, greater beauty. And you know what? It's okay if we don't know the way. We don't have to know the way right? That's what faith is for. We listen and we act when God speaks. See, right now we are here. We are here to wake up to new beginnings, to wake up to greater potential in spite of everything that we see, right? In spite of the scary things going on, in spite of where we think we could never do what we want to do, we are here to wake up to that greater potential, We are here to seek only the wonder that is God. And that is how we are creating heaven on earth. So until next time, remember, you are divinely designed to be doing all of this. You are a -a one-time, one-of-a-kind cosmic event. In everything you do, you are blessed. And so it is.